staff. Um, welcome everyone to tonight's study session. We're excited to have the opportunity to uh, engage with staff tonight to learn about two very timely topics. First, we'll have an opportunity to learn about the ethnic studies and tribal history curriculum, and then we will learn more about the district's community engagement framework. Superintendent Guerrero, would you please uh, begin tonight's session? You just said it, two important topics tonight. So I'm just gonna hit the volleyball over to our chief academic officer, Dr. Luis Valentino, who will let you know uh, and introduce the fabulous staff we have for you tonight. Yes, yeah, so good evening, Board President Larry, Superintendent Guerrero, directors. Um, the resolution that you voted on this evening speaks volumes to Portland Public Schools commitment to creating a socially, a socially just school district that serves all students. And so this evening, uh, Dr. Tanya McKee, working with her team, will share some of the tangible aspects of that resolution and the related state legislation. But more importantly, they will engage you in a task and conversation grounded in a liberatory pedagogy, which really means that there it, it has a strong focus on the principles for social change and transformation. And so we hope that you will not only in, enjoy as we as they take you on this journey, but that you engage with them um, in, in the activity that goes along with it. So I will, I will then pass it on to Dr. Tanya McKee. All right, thank you, um, uh, uh, school board and Superintendent Guerrero. Um, I'm here with uh, my team, Dr. Christina Granby, uh, Trina Wicker and David Martinez. And um, we are going to give you a brief overview, but the majority of our time is doing a, um, several activities. And uh, superintendent and board members received a little gift this weekend, or uh, maybe this week, um, to help you with some of the activities that we're going to engage in. So just to kind of give you a real quick um, overview, um, we will make sure that we um, talk about the House Bill 2845, Senate bills 13 and 664. So we'll break those down on a slide just so you can see what those are. And then we'll move into our classroom connections for you to engage with tonight. Then we'll get to, after we finish that up, we're gonna actually connect to the PPS vision just so you can see where we're at in terms of where this work is uh, with the visioning work. Talk about the continuous improvement of curriculum and how the curriculum adoption, um, the bond uh, supports the work that we're doing as well as all of the PD opportunities that we had last year and are continuing to have to support this work. And then we'll talk about next steps and investments and leave a couple of minutes for questions. So with that, we will begin. David? Can you hear me now? Thank <laughs> yeah. you. All right. All right, so I'm going to do a quick overview of the two Senate bills and the one House bill that we're going to be connecting with tonight. Uh, so Tribal History Shared History, which is Senate Bill 13, was passed in 2017, um, and it's a critical opportunity to fully leverage the strengths, assets, and contributions of our Native American uh, community, and specifically the nine federally organized tribes of Oregon. Um, and it really helps to uh, contribute towards not just curriculum, but essential understandings and critical orientations that help really shift uh, teacher, uh, student and um, district. Um, then we have ethnic studies, uh, which is House Bill 2845, and that was passed in 2018. And that directs the state uh, to create K through 12 social studies standards, um, excuse me, ethnic studies standards that are embedded within the state or uh, social studies standards. And that's K 12. Um, the timing for that has been shifted a bit because of COVID, and we're expected to have those passed by the House. Uh, sometime this winter or not early spring. And then we have Senate Bill 664. Uh, and Senate Bill 664 um, is a two-way bill kind of and starts this year with implementation of just general education about Holocaust and genocide, uh, just acknowledging that the Holocaust happened and that genocides have occurred both within the United States and abroad. And so all those bills um, basically have started enacting this year in various ways and then uh, progressively uh, throughout the years will actually increase and change over time. And so next, we're really excited uh, to get started with our classroom connections. So 
uh, board members, apologies for those that are did not get that fantastic delivery of goodies this weekend, but we hope you can follow along. Uh, but for our board members who did, um, we'd love for you to please put on your uh, student hats and engage us as you would in the uh, distant learning world as if, uh, as if we were your teachers and you were our students. And welcome to our classroom. So, welcome, director. And I'm going to hand it over to Christina Granby, uh, who will start it off. Greetings to all of our evening learners. To warm our brains up and dig into our first topic, we're going to do a little bell ringer or a warm up. And here's the prompt. When you consider the physical features of land, what's one aspect that you appreciate about living on the land known as Oregon? Now, as you think, here are some ideas. Think about Oregon's natural features, such as its rivers, forests, beaches, mountains, trails, and so on. You're gonna have exactly 30 seconds to ponder your response. And at that time, everyone will be asked to type their response into the chat using a complete utterance or a complete sentence. To help you frame your response in academic language, there's an optional sentence frame on this slide, and it includes some language choices that range in difficulty level. So feel free to use it to jot down a response or just to keep in mind for to type. And the 30 seconds will begin right now if David could start it. And just as a reminder, the prompt is when you consider the physical features of land, what's one aspect you appreciate about living in the land known as Oregon? I don't think we can chat. Can we, Roseanne? I just I just checked and it's a, it's enabled. Oh, great. Looks like the timer's going a little early, so it's restarting. I'm really liking the people I'm seeing using a nice sentence frame with a clause at the beginning. That's a difficult grammatical structure. So it's a nice challenge to take on. All right, looks like that was 30 seconds. And if you haven't typed your response in, please go ahead and do it now. We have time for a couple of volunteers if someone would like to read their response aloud now that you've had time to chew it in your mind and jot it down using a sentence frame. So if you'd like to share, uh, please use your Google raise hand function and I will call in a couple people. And I know some people don't necessarily have the hand raise function yet. I didn't have it at first either. So if someone would like to pop out and just go ahead and unmute yourself and share, that's fine too. Um, this is Michelle. I um, appreciate the um, entire Cascade Range. Uh, when I think about Oregon, I think about the mountains. And I love appreciating every aspect of the mountains from climbing and hiking, skiing, picnicking. Thank you. And I appreciate you adding all those supporting details to your response. That's that really illustrates it for us. Would anybody else like to pop out and unmute? So um, yeah, this is Andrew. I, I love the dramatic topography and growing up here, I didn't realize that was special until I lived on the East Coast um, and realized that not every place has mountains that crash into oceans and big gorges and canyons, et cetera. So um, it's something to, it's pretty special. Thank you. I really like the imagery that you shared there. Would anyone, one more person like to share out before we move on? This is Amy. Um, I wrote, I think about the diversity. So, you know, the incredible dry high desert, the dramatic mountains, the damp coast range, you know, we just have so many different ecosystems within our state. It's, it's amazing diversity. Thank you. And just personally, I have to appreciate that you called out the high desert because that is my, my heartland. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. You did a fantastic job with your participation and especially crafting some responses with thoughtful language choices. And now we're going to go ahead and welcome David back to continue our discussion about land.
and David is muted. I know David's our David's working with two screens and doing all of our text. Thank so you. I Sorry. Understand. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Director DePass. Uh, what a fantastic uh, segue into our land acknowledgement. Just a show of hands, how many folks here have have heard of a land acknowledgement? Uh, done one before? Uh, been present? Great. We see a good a good show of hands. Um, <clears throat> For folks that haven't um, done a land, land haven't uh, either witnessed, been a part of one, or done them themselves, um, I'm going to borrow this from Mary Lyons from the Beachy Land Band of um, Ojibwe, uh, which is in the Midwestern states. Um, and land, acknowledge, land acknowledgement, just as we were doing uh, with the previous activity, the well, well, bell ringer that Christina was doing, uh, really helps us to appreciate the land that we're on. Um, but not just appreciate the land that we're on now, but uh, everything that it's done uh, to give us uh, the life today. And so acknowledging that uh, since time immemorial, we've had uh, Native communities and folks here uh, living, breathing, and um, honoring the land. And so we do that also to, to respect that and to continue that today. And so I just want to quote her, and she says, uh, it's important to understand the longstanding history that has brought you to reside on the land and to seek to understand your place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. When we talk about land, land is part of who we are. It's a mixture of our blood, our past, our current and our future. We carry our ancestors in us and they're around us as you all do. Uh, so with that, we're going to do a quick uh, Portland land acknowledgement. Uh, and before I do that, I also want to let, uh, acknowledge that there's various land acknowledgements right now for Portland. Um, and because it was such a diverse um, land that really welcomed uh, bands from across the Northwest and really across the, the North American region. Um, and so it's, it's difficult to just say one um, community lived here when um, we know dozens and beyond that really um, thrived along the land. So uh, we'd like to honor and recognize the indigenous peoples of the Portland metro region on whose ancestral lands our district stands. These include the Willamette Tumwater, Clackamas, Klamath, Molala, Multnomah, and Wallato Chinook peoples, and the Tualatin, Kalapuya, who today are part of the Confederate tribe of Grand Ron, and many other native communities who made their homes along the Columbia River. We also want to recognize that Portland today is a community of many diverse native peoples who we'll continue to live and work here. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities past, present, future, and are grateful for their ongoing and vibrant presence. And I also wanna note that uh, students, it took me a while to get those names and I didn't pronounce them all uh, probably uh, perfectly, but the best part is we're learning and the best part is that we can continue to learn. And so I encourage you um, to practice those, those words and we'll practice those together uh, as the school year goes on. And so next, I want us to put our thinking brains on. And I'm going to just put this image for you up for just a couple of seconds and minutes. And if, if you're not able to actually see that image, I'm going to put it in the chat. And you can actually go to the live website. So feel free to do that if you can't see this image. I'm just going to ask, what do you notice? What do you wonder? I'm going to go back. And feel free to write in the chat, what do you notice and what do you wonder? And I'm actually gonna pull up another closer image. Maybe it might be a little more recognizable for folks. So once again, what do you notice and what do you wonder? So this about a minute, if you wanna look into that, please uh, provide a little response in the chat. What do you notice? What do you wonder? And I'll take any volunteers. I will also read some of the comments. National boundaries are irrelevant. I notice overlapping. I notice the overlapping territory. I notice the Columbia River, right? A huge diversity of peoples. I wonder how much we have lost and I wonder how much of our community are influenced by those communities of peoples. Great wondering. Anyone wanna speak aloud or 
pop out if you don't have the hand feature. Uh, it makes me think about the housing crisis <laughs> um, because we talk about it in you know today's terms. If you ask people when the housing crisis started, they say you know in the last 15 years, uh, 20 years in Portland, but we've actually had it for hundreds of years. It's a great comment. It's a great perspective, right? We've talked about this before in class on on whose perspective when we say um, housing, right? And who who you ask, you can get a really different response. Right, and so really, really important thing about perspective. Thank you. Anyone else? It makes me think about ways that we have controlled and scarred the land, some of which are um, irreversible. I mean, just today we have a decision in Oregon about removal of some dams to try to restore fish populations, but um, you, you can't entirely undo those kind of long-term effects. Thank you. Well, thank you all for sharing. This is a, another great segue into our next activity. And uh, this is for, for board members and superintendent, if you have that packet folder, um, we did provide you some supplies for our next activity to make it a bit more hands-on. Um, so you have um, the one sheeter that has these nine arrows, as well as a small sheet of paper that has these flags. You also have a pair of scissors, I hope, and glue stick. Please be careful of those scissors. Um, we just put them in the folder for safety. Um, and what we'd like you to do, so first and foremost, these nine flags are the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon. These are the flags. And, and these nine uh, arrows are the cultural centers of those tribes. So this is the, the location of our nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon. And what we'd like you to do is to use your scissors, glue sticks, and your knowledge to place these flags where these cultural centers and these reservations are today. And so we're gonna take about four minutes to do this activity. Um, we're really excited that you have this hands-on. And if we were really truly in our distance world, we have you on a Canvas course, which we actually have this during Soft Start in Canvas and also in a Seesaw for our our fourth graders who are going to be doing this uh, later on. So I'm going to start that timer. I'm just going to play a little music in the background as we would in the classroom to kind of get us grooving along, but we'll take four minutes. Um, and any questions before we begin? Everybody have their, their David, sheet of- I just want to yes. be clear, this little sheet. Yes. And we're going to cut these out. Yes. And then we're going to glue them onto this big map of Oregon. Yes, and the, you're going to glue them specifically to those arrows. So once again, those arrows are the cultural centers of our nine fairly recognized tribes of Oregon. All right, I'm gonna start that timer. Are we gonna be graded on our cutting ability? We will not judge and we will not force you to present it to the rest of the group. Thank you for asking, only if you want to. Didn't anybody tell you you should not give sharp objects to board members? I, I do want to mention that I did mention that to my team that Scott Bailey would say something about the scissors tonight. We're well, pretty sure those were safety scissors in those folders. I think that rule only applies when we're in person, Scott. So we're okay. <laughs> okay I think we're safe since you're all in your own homes. Raise your hand if you ran with them this weekend. Ow, I cut myself.
four minutes. So if you could take your last blue stick, number three, and that's more than enough for your sticking. More than that, it's gonna get messy. Oh wow. That's if you are willing and so brave, I do encourage you to please, board members, show us your maps. I'm not sure it's right, but it's done. So at this time, if you could pull out your first Oregonians book and open to the very last page, you should find an answer key. Yes, 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 indeed. Easter eggs everywhere. Good job. Tricky, so, David. Tricky. And here, also uh, on this slide, I did put it in there uh, for your reference as well that you do have the answer key. Um, and here, we're just going to do a quick debrief about the activity, um, some reflection questions. What thoughts or feelings came up as you completed the activity? How does this map connect with what you already know? How has this map challenged your thinking? And to what extent do you think this map tells the full story of indigenous peoples in Oregon? And also, I think this is one I'd love to, to, to know is what will you carry forward with you from this learning? So I'd love uh, anybody pop in. And, and, and... Hi, so I'll go first. Um, the thought or feeling I had as I did this activity is I, I was embarrassed. I've grown up in Oregon. And I've heard these tribal names my whole life, and I knew where some of them were more because of the name of the place rather than any knowledge of the peoples. Um, and then I, I wasn't 100% sure about all of them, even though I'm from here. Um, and so it was that embarrassment of not not knowing and not having paid attention. And then the question about what do you think this map tell? Do you think this map tells the full story? My other my other thought was there are so many stories not revealed in those federally recognized tribes. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, the other question to me it raises is this may be where the reservation land is as opposed to the true land um, or, or territory where people lived. Uh, in particular, when I, um, this past couple of days, when I looked at the actual reservation construction and I just, I guess in my head, I had this reservation as a big block and a couple of them are really disparate, small patches of disconnected land. Um, and just all those issues around land are so central to this story. So one thing I thought about looking at it is I thought about the Cow Creek Indians and I was in D Washington DC working for the Senate when they were re-recognized and thinking about erasure and how it's the US government gets to recognize whether somebody actually exists or a community exists and actually they were terminated before they were even recognized and then they had to go petition to be re-recognized re and sort of what that the trauma that would do to a people to um not be recognized and they're just one of many of the tribes i think about the treaties as i was doing this exercise and of the hundreds of treaties that were created between the u.s government and the tribes uh, not a single one was honored Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, and about the money, the, the money still owed today um, by the government to the tribes that has been hung up for years. Uh, the promise of housing uh, in the gorge from the displacement of the dams. Um, that is what decades late in being, um, I think the commitment finally came through uh, and on and on and on. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. No, this is all, all fantastic. Thanks so much for engaging. Just wanted to mention one thing that I, I learned from um, 
African professor, um, a Native professor, uh, you know, Native Americans are, are the only the only ethnic group that have to carry around proof of their ethnicity. To you know, that's something to have to prove with a card. Um, um, that's that's a difficult, um, and I think we raised that. And and notice also, I think uh, Scott brought it up. I, I said these were the cultural centers, right? These weren't the headquarters. These weren't the the native lands. These were the cultural centers of the current uh, reservations. So it's really intentional on on what we're saying there as well. So thank you all for participating. I'm going to hand it over to Terena now. All right. Hi, everybody. So we are going to move from sort of an upper elementary fourth grade lesson experience into something that you might experience more in middle school or high school. And it's a reading activity where we're going to work collaboratively to grow our knowledge and then share our thinking as a result of our learning. Uh, somewhere in your wonderful packets, you have a guide a to the essential understandings so if you would have that handy that'll make this activity go smoothly just like what david is holding up there the tribal history shared history essential understandings beautiful book all right um, what we're going to be doing is a reading activity where we collaborate to build our understanding and we use a graphic organizer and so what you see on the screen right now is that graphic organizer embedded with its instructions. And I'm going to run through what we'll be looking for as we're reading, and then we'll do an example, and then we'll work together. Well, we'll sort of work individually, and then we'll share our answers together before we finalize our thinking. So this graphic organizer asks you to read about one of the essential understandings, and then write down, jot down some notes as you're reading about keywords, so what are some of the important terms and words that come up for you and stick out for you? And this is about your thinking, so there's no wrong word to write down. There's no wrong keyword in the page. I don't have an answer key for this. Um, the context, we're actually not going to um, put time into that. The context is done for you on the one we'll collaborate on together. But then we're gonna move over into these questions, misunderstandings, and examples. And again, as we're doing this, these are your questions. So after you read it, what questions do you have or what questions might someone else have? And then misunderstandings, what are some confusion or misconceptions that are attached to this, um, this essential understanding? And then finally, some examples of those misunderstandings. And as we get into our example, you'll be able to see those a little more clearly. This graphic organizer asks for a definition. We're actually gonna sort of gloss over the definition as well. And then the meat of it, our assessment for this piece, will be to create a tweet. So if you have to describe what's important, what this essential understanding means, the heart of the essential understanding in 280 characters or less in a tweet, that's going to be your sort of assessment for this piece and how we check that we've all collaborated, grown our strength and our knowledge together and come out with everybody having a really great understanding that they can share about this essential understanding. So we're gonna take a look at an example you can find this page in your packet on page four. We're gonna look at since time immemorial. And when David was talking about the land acknowledgement, he talked about people who have been in what we now call Oregon since before anybody can remember. Um, it's described in here as since forever, um, which I love. And so this idea that we don't, um, well, I'll just go through the, the unit. I could get carried away talking about it, but I'm gonna follow the graphic organizer. <laughs> Um, so it talks about the keywords and it brings up some of those land words that we brought up when we were talking about Oregon. So the coast, valleys, plateaus, but then it also ex has these other words of relationship and continuous and existed. So you can see already kind of where this, where this is going and what this understanding is about. And then again, sort of glossing over the context and moving into questions. One of the questions are, is what are examples of oral traditions? So maybe after reading this, you're like, I wanna know more about oral traditions. And then the misunderstandings, the idea that people think the Bering Strait theory is true. A little background knowledge, it used to be believed that people came over and walked across the Bering Strait a certain number of years ago. I'm bad with the numbers. For a history person, I'm not great with dates. <laughs> um, but it turns out that people came by boat way, way earlier than anybody ever thought. Um, and the science just keeps pointing to earlier and earlier and earlier presences of people in the Western Hemisphere. So that's a misunderstanding. 
And then an example of that is that there are at least nine nations who have been here before anyone else has ever been. So those are sort of the things that we'll work on together is building those and we'll share our thinkings for the keywords, questions, misunderstandings, and examples. And then after we've shared, we'll come to the tweet. And so the tweet sort of boiling it all down, what's important here for this one is indigenous people have been in a relationship with the land and water since forever, which I think is a very nice, concise way to bring that together. So that's what we're gonna be working towards, but we're gonna do a different essential understanding. We're gonna be looking at history, which is on, oh, I wrote down page nine. <laughs> um, so if you turn to page nine, it's about a page long. And what um, I would like you to do is read through, I believe you have this graphic organizer on paper as well. So if you're the kind of person who wants to write things down as you're reading, jot down keywords, questions, misunderstandings, examples. Don't write your tweet just yet. I want you to hold off on the tweet, but the other pieces, we've got about five minutes to read through and take your notes. We'll have the timer going again. Maybe David can uh, play a little music for us again. I think the timer plays some like relaxing meditation music. I've also linked in the chat the essential understandings, this packet. If anybody likes to follow along in PDF, we're on page nine, essential, under, essential understanding number three, history. And then we'll place the music in there.
towards zero, just be ready. I don't want anybody to have an abrupt stop. So just know that that's coming and that very soon we'll transition into the next piece, which is the most exciting part to me, which is where we collaborate and grow stronger in our knowledge together. Um, after we've all had a chance to interact with the text, now what we're going to do is sort of transition into sharing. And in a classroom where students had accounts for all of the things that we were ready for, and we had a lot more time, I might do this in a flashier way where we do um, you know, something in a Nearpod or we do a Padlet or any number of other tools, but we are gonna work simple and quickly with what we've got. And we're gonna share in the chat once again, we might be able to capture some of your thinking on the slide. Um, but what I'd like for you to do is just keywords. So in the chat, just type the keywords that came up for you. And we're gonna try to capture that on our collective graphic organizer. And we're gonna move through these fairly quickly. All right, excellent. Inferior life ways altered. Settler colonialism is definitely a key term in there that's coming up over and over again. Invasion, for sure. Begin, I like that. All right. Um, and just being mindful of time. Normally I'd let this sort of sit longer, but let's move into um, our questions and just type one question. You might have a bunch, but I want you to pick your favorite to type in and we'll probably only get to type one or two into the organizer. Um, and then I encourage you to look as they're coming through as well. It's great to see everybody's thinking. Ooh, that's an excellent question. What life ways remain unaltered? Fantastic. How did indigenous people respond to settlers? Okay, right. And how did tribal nations interact with one another? Again, with that notion of history of Native Americans doesn't start with the Eastern invasion as they describe it, but that it existed prior to that. Excellent. All right, and then very quickly, let's do misunderstandings and examples kind of rolling in together, uh, resilience of indigenous peoples. So um, either an example of a misunderstanding or that misunderstanding, let's roll a couple of those in as well. These are excellent responses. I get super excited when I get to see people's thinking. Um, so I'm in heaven right now <laughs> watching all of this come through. How do we publicly recover our histories after years of denial? Yeah, that's a big piece of the work, right? That's going into this is how do we, how do we find those stories? How do we tell those stories? How do we honor those stories? Absolutely. Yes, the idea of civilized versus primitive, the big sales pitch. Yes, that people and yeah, that people that were here and the invaders were both all the same, that there was diversity in that there were two groups, but in fact, there was diversity among all of the groups. Wonderful. I don't know the mural at Grant. I don't get out much these days. Um, <laughs> All right, excellent. Okay, so now it is time for your assessment. We're going to do the tweet and we actually are going to use a tool. We're gonna to use what's called a Jamboard and it's a whiteboard that we'll share in the meeting. Um, and what I'm going to do is set this up. It should open up in a tab for you automatically. Oh, what it'll do is it'll send a link in the chat and then you will click on the link. And what I'd like you to do is make a sticky note for your tweet. So we're just gonna take about a minute for this tweet. Um, the sticky note on the left-hand side, you see a bunch of tools. The sticky note is the fourth tool down. And when you hover over it, it says sticky note. Excellent. Thank you, David. You can watch those populate.
All right. History begins before the white narrative. Such a key piece of this. You do not define me. And then a tiny one. <laughs> Indigenous peoples have a deep, rich, and often misunderstood history. I love this. I love watching these come alive. So as they continue, I am going to stop talking for a second and open the floor again, just for a quick reflection, very, very quick because we are tight on time. But if anyone has other um, thoughts or feelings that came up from this, just as from the mapping activity, if there was anything that came up for you while doing this activity. And you can just pop out. All right, well, if everybody's sort of deep in thought, we are going to move right along. I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Christina, who's gonna bring us home. Thank you, those were super exciting activities. Uh, in the interest of time, I did move something a little bit on the PowerPoint. And <clears throat> so now we're gonna talk about connecting to our PPS vision. Through all of our learning activities this evening, we hope to introduce you to how we're not just fulfilling legislative directives, but we're moving above and beyond. And we have some examples of that that really illustrate how our work with ethnic studies and tribal history, shared history, and genocide education will support the system shifts and the development of our educator essentials, which we'll need to achieve the promise of the graduate portrait. And, Sorry, I'm just looking at the slide. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so through the continuous improvement of curriculum, that's how we're operationalizing what we've talked about today. So as you've seen the legislation, SB 13 requires lessons to be taught at elementary, middle school, high school levels in five curricular areas, math, science, English language arts, health PE, and the social sciences. And just as one example of how we're trying to go above and beyond in the curriculum work, um, we're trying to strive in the Office of Teaching and Learning to weave Indigenous perspectives, voices, authors, and knowledge throughout the curriculum and across all the content areas. So just one example is from our high school language arts curriculum. In 10th grade, uh, in the legislation, two lessons are required. In our scope and sequence, we call out the highest leverage points where teachers could embed the available ODE lessons to go with the standards and the themes that are already there. And the units and the lessons are in our Atlas curriculum management system. Um, they guide the teachers to our SB 13 resources, including some that you've seen today, such as the essential understandings and something you'll see in a minute, the critical orientations for indigenous studies. And that'll be your homework, hint, hint. And we also illustrate how to use those in the curriculum. So our goal is not just to suggest standalone lessons, but to weave them thematically into units to expand that accountability toward Native perspectives, living as the natural part of the curriculum. A couple of our TOSAs have actually written professional goals around including texts from Indigenous authors and voices in every unit for all four years of high school language arts as they write the sample lessons this year. Um, and in addition, the ethnic studies, um, I think we're on a different slide, but that's okay. <laughs> Ethnic studies, the same thing. We have the lessons required embedded, but the, the priority standards are not just Oregon social sciences standards anymore. Our PPS ethnic studies standards actually appear as priority and supporting standards throughout our social sciences units. Um, the one that's on the slide here, this is from our Atlas management system, a few screenshots. This is a US history unit called the failure of reconstruction. And if you were to zoom in, you could see that the guiding priority standard is a PPS ethnic studies standard and that frames the entirety of the unit. So that just shows how uh, through, our, through our prioritization process and through our sample lesson writing with our teacher GVC teams, the ethnic studies standards are really clearly at the forefront of all the work that's already happening. And our final little tidbit is just to share with you uh, some of the work that's happened so far and will continue with professional development around the House bill and the Senate bills we've talked about tonight. A couple highlights from this year include uh, sponsoring PPS educators to attend the Oregon Council for Social Sciences conference to learn about the bills. 
Also, all of our district leaders having SB 13 sessions at our leadership afternoon sessions this year and a full day training that was hosted for about 90 PPS educators at the Portland Art Museum and included some time over at the Oregon Historical Society. And finally, we had a really great chance this summer for our team to present the SB 13 work in Portland at the Grand Ronds Tribal Education Summit. So for our upcoming activities, to end us out on this note, we're funding extended hours for some of our teachers who are, who are interested and would like to take the self-guided new ODE SB 13 modules that are available. And of course, again, we'll be funding educators to attend the Social Sciences Council Conference again next year. And next, we're going to swing back to the critical orientations that I mentioned. Just for time, we want to respect your time, so hopefully I'm not talking too fast. But the critical orientations for Indigenous studies, these, these are a framework that support the shifting practices that we talked about, especially as individuals and organizations work toward decolonizing systems. This is a framework that was developed by Dr. Leilani Sabsalian, who is an assistant professor of Indigenous studies at the University of Oregon. Um, this framework is really going to be valuable for us. It provides the six critical orientations. You also have a really detailed handout that's displayed right now. It's beautiful. It's in color in your packet, and that'll be for you to look at later. So this is kind of your homework going forward before we end up, and it's kind of a quiet reflection to review the critical orientations, absorb them as you reflect in the future, and we all reflect on our work going forward. These will really frame our thinking around our work to decolonize our curriculum and our instructional practices in Portland Public Schools. And it will guide us as we realize the vision, shifting systems and creating educator essentials to realize the graduate portrait for all of the students. All right, we, we know we're at time and I really wanna thank um, the board for engaging with us. Um, I think we could have run a little longer. I was keeping track of time and I was like, well, you guys are doing such a great job and we appreciate you engaging with us. But just really quickly, you can see on this slide um, some of the next steps and in investment. So the SIA dollars are really important for our work around our ethnic study standards and our House and Senate bills, um, helping us with online module training. And one of the big pieces that we are will be working to um, create is our third and fourth grade student materials with um, engagement from the community around those materials. So one of the units that people might be familiar with is the history of Vanport. And it's been talked about before. Um, but we need we need more material creation. And so we're going to work with the community and use some of the SIA dollars to do that, as well as a million dollars um, it, 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 for the beginning of our ethnic studies, social studies, um, social sciences curriculum adoption. And then just two other pieces to share as we've been, you heard about this in the dyslexia, as we've been um, restructuring humanity to better meet the needs of our students, part of that restructure is to dedicate to make sure we have a, a TOSA position that is focused on high school social sciences with these house bills, as well as literacy support. So you might have noticed that tonight, we were very intentional with um, integrating literacy strategies throughout our activities because we're all language teachers. And so it's really important that we're also modeling that as we were talking about the social sciences and ethnic studies tonight. And then also we are short an administrator on our team. They all did an amazing job tonight, um, but we are hiring an academic programs associate dedicated to the ethnic studies and social sciences work. As David had mentioned, um, the ethnic study standards are now in our social study standards, um, but we are waiting for them to be officially approved by ODE. And so we do have these positions posted. Um, so please share out with those that are interested um, for those positions. So again, thank you to everyone. Um, it was great for you to engage with us tonight around the, some of the work that we're doing. Questions? I just I want to thank everybody, David, um, Torena, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and Christina and Tanya for um, presenting this as it was really exciting. I have a question, um, and I should know this, but does the district have a tribal liaison that works in the intergovernmental space? 
Do we have someone that works with tribes? So, so Dr. Angie Morell, she is our, um, her, I think her position is like student success manager for Indian education. She's the director. The director. I, okay. I was, I, I guess, referring more to someone that would be intergovernmental. I director, director to pass. I could speak to that. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so Dr. Angie Morrill, who is our director of Title IX, uh, serves as our de facto uh, 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 liaison with uh, all of our uh, Oregon tribes here. And, uh, Thank you. We've also been in communication through the humanities department. We've been to some of the government to government meetings, specifically the education section of those to to um, one, to showcase our plan, but also to ensure that we want them a part of the conversation. Uh, one <laughs> that Tanya mentioned with the student facing resources and what we're doing in the fourth grade is taking all those 15 lessons that were provided by ODE and the Senate, um, Senate Bill 13, and really making them accessible to students um, and educators. And so that is gonna be in partnership with all of the nine federally recognized tribes. But we have been, um, as a humanities department, working with them, um, we've gone down, uh, Driven, driven a lot of hours, but it's, I think, thanks for recognizing that, that we're working with nine different governments when we do that, and they're independent of each other. And so the, the process for that takes a lot more time than I think folks recognize. Um, but yes, thank you. Tanya, this is Amy. I want to go back for a second to your last slide. You don't have to put it back up, but when you're talking about the investments that we have made and are making, um, you know, this is an exciting area of our new bond that we just passed where we're going to make a historic investment in curriculum materials. And part of that is to refresh outdated and, and racist, you know, hard hard copy curriculum resources that are our only option at this point so to me this is one of the most exciting opportunities um of of our our voters giving us the ability to, to invest in in uh new curriculum resources and i don't know uh dr valentino or um dr mckee if you want to speak to that a little bit i know we haven't started the process of of allocating those funds but I'd be interested in how this priority, um, how you're looking at this priority within that opportunity. So we have begun to um, make a plan. Um, actually, Christina, Terena, and David have created a proposal um, for our ethnic studies, social sciences, um, curriculum K-12. So we're starting, we're able to use some of our SIA dollars first, right, as we move into the adoption. So they've begun a proposal um, that will uh, will be focused on engaging the community. Uh, the other piece I want to make sure that we mention is that this work isn't done in isolation in humanities. Um, as we mentioned, SB 13 does span over into the other disciplines of STEAM, but also our work is, um, it's important for us to work with Danny um, as well with all of the RESJ um, supports and framework. And so I want to make sure I mention that we're also working with people in OSP, um, Tina Wolf and others um, to ensure that as we're moving this work forward, um, PSU, for example, um, Dr. Maria Tenario, um, that we're not doing this in isolation. We happen to be the ones presenting tonight, um, but there are a lot of others within um, PPS and outside PPS that is supporting this. And so one of our, it's not a challenge, it's an opportunity as we go through this adoption, because it is historic, is that trying to ensure that we've engaged as many people as possible in the work that we're doing um, so that we have all the resources that meet the needs of our students. I have one last final comment. Julie, were you gonna go ahead? I was just going to say um, thank the team for sharing it. Um, as somebody who went through PPS um, from kindergarten through 12th grade, um, you know, most of the sort of Oregon history we learned about was about the, the pioneers coming out on the Oregon Trail. And um, but for a family at Glencoe um, that shared their history, there wouldn't have been any 
representation of um, indigenous cultures and the communities in the state. And so I am just, I think it's such a great thing that our students uh, moving forward will not be missing that really important uh, component of their, of, of the states and this land's history. Julia, you didn't go to Chief Laluska? Pardon? You didn't go to Chief Laluska? <laughs> oh, I went, well, um, I don't think one field trip makes up for a whole <laughs> unit on the Oregon Trail. <laughs> of, yes, I did go to Chief Aluska, but uh, let's say um, it was more episodic uh, versus integrated. And it was like, that's somebody else's culture. And really the pioneers are, you know, Oregon's, like Oregon's culture. So it's gonna be a huge, um, just shift and pivot for our students and how they look at our our state and the people. Yeah, in uh, fourth grade at Fernwood Elementary, we sang the state song every morning. And if you know the words to that song, um, that, that's that's definitely the the victors writing history. Um, we, we, we might want to someday look at getting a different state song, but that's another discussion, but just greatly appreciate your work. Um, what I'd love to see offline is just a brief sketch out of like timeline in terms of implementation at grade level, nothing too fancy, but just, um, to give me some, um, uh, and us really some talking points uh, if we're at a school to say next year your third grader will see X in the as part of their curriculum kind of a a couple of talking points like that to give us an idea of how this is being implemented would be um, again a, a way that we can really make this impactful when we talk to school communities. Hey, Scott, I just want to piggyback on that because my thought that I wanted to add before we leave is that however we can highlight this work to our community is really important. I mean, just as we're having this meeting, I got an email notification on my screen from an angry parent about how you guys aren't doing anything about ethnic studies and it's time. I'm sure you haven't even considered this and all that, you know, right now. And it's like, well, I wish you were watching this presentation you can see the amazing work that's actually underway. So um, the more we can highlight this with our community and with our other school district partners, um, the better. I didn't really, I didn't fully finish my thank you um, for Terena because I got hung up on your name, David, um, Christina, and Tanya, and thank you so much for the work. And I'm, I'm really also happy as a, as a native Oregonian um, that this work is happening. And as I was going through the presentation and the materials this weekend, I, I felt um, that I, I would love to see this for, for black, and I say black, you know, people from the African diaspora, um, we need to do this too. We need to, you know, move towards like a pro blackness curriculum also, I mean, we, we need to include other ethnicities in this work, um, this amazing work, um, really appreciate it. I, I wasn't here in the third grade, so I didn't um, get that. I was uh, went to school in Mexico, so I, I avoided this um, settler um, you know, narrative, and, and I feel happy for that. I'm really happy for the um, kids coming up behind us, though, that are um, able to benefit from um, being proud of their history and culture. Yeah, I would, I would suggest is we didn't get a chance to go through the critical orientations, but when we talk about what we have to do different here in the Portland Public Schools is going through those critical orientations um, because it really helps us take a look at not just the curriculum, right, not just the practices, but, you know, different decisions that we're making in the Portland Public Schools and so some of the things you're already mentioning, using those critical orientations as some of your, you know, guideposts um, to think about some of this work we need, we need to do. Definitely for something, it really for our team 
um, we'll be using those um, as well because it really gave us an opportunity to have some really powerful conversations on our team about the work that we're doing. And I That's think we're gonna we're gonna hear more of that and some of the ways we're we're using those critical orientations to engage with our community to influence our decision making next from Jonathan and his team. So I want to thank you all. This was lovely. Thank you for the packets. I, I look forward to reading more fully in the books you've sent us and the work you've given us. And I'm excited to hear some of those, um, how we as a board can put some of the learnings we've just inspired into action with our community engagement team. So superintendent, would you like to direct, introduce this next portion of our study session tonight? Yeah, I also want to uh, thank uh, staff and, and, and this team in particular for, for all the hard work here and we look forward to seeing uh, much more and this work continuing to evolve and be more encompassing. But we do have a second topic this evening and we have another team on deck uh, uh, and I think we have a slide deck that we'll use to, to guide the conversation if we can get that up. Thank you, Tanya and team. And, uh, and, and I'll kick us off on, on the title slide here, uh, just, just to share a, a few remarks to, to set context, because uh, and I think we've seen this uh, on behalf of our board of directors. Uh, I, too, uh, believe in the power of our community to shape the future of our school system. I think that was evident in our community driven and developed uh, vision. Um, and if, if we're going to advance uh, and improve outcomes and accelerate outcomes in some cases for, for our students, uh, there has to be a strong parent community district relationship. Um, and if we want uh, the feedback uh, necessary and the input necessary to create policies and opportunities for, for every student, I think we're in the middle of that now uh, so that our students can thrive in our schools. Uh, especially our black native and students of color, then as an institution, we have to keep uh, learning to do our work better, uh, figure out what works best, maybe what doesn't, um, and shift uh, our ability in ways to, to engage and create access points uh, so we hear those opinions, ideas, feelings, and dreams of, of our students and community. So uh, in the end, uh, those relationships are really about people uh, at the core of this work. Uh, of course, so uh, tonight uh, among the people, we, we have a great team here with Shanice Clark, uh, our Director of Community Engagement. Um, tonight, Shanice and Jonathan Garcia, our Chief Engagement Officer, uh, will provide an introduction to the driving values, the goals, and the a framework uh, for PPS's community engagement and student voice uh, infrastructure. So. Uh, and then we'll be, this will be followed by a shared conversation between the Board of directors and staff. So I'm looking forward to this conversation as part of our ongoing efforts to engage uh, a diverse community that we serve uh, in increasingly more authentic ways. Thank you. Superintendent, Thank you. Jonathan, before you begin, I, I realize that some people might need a bio break or a stretch break. So can we take a two minute break? Is that okay, Jonathan, to, to mm -hmm. honor some of those needs people are having? Okay, we'll see everybody back in two minutes. Thank you. I think we're uh, ready to resume. Great. Well, thank you again, uh, Chair Lowry and members of the board. Um, good evening. Uh, it is 930, so um, we'll we'll try um, to uh, we're not we don't have scissors or 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 any anything exciting, but um, hopefully this is a rich conversation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so really quick. Uh, thank you, Superintendent, for the introduction. So. Tonight, we really just want to have a, a share a little bit about our driving values, our goals, and framework. Um, so Shanice Clark, our director of engagement, uh, will share a, a lot more there. Uh, and then and during our discussion, we really have two 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 very specific discussions. One are on engagement just generally, and then two uh, really begin to have a conversation around community advisory councils. Um, so we'll get into uh, a, a discussion uh, there. Um, so just really want to start and again, uh, as what I, what I appreciate about even today being on, uh, on this call, uh, is the way in which, um, our vision, um, is showing up, uh, in all aspects of who we are and what we're, we're doing, we're, we're making the intentional effort of connecting the dots and, 
And I think when I think about uh, back in 2018, when, when this board and the superintendent uh, launched a conversation um, across the community, I think there was, um, there was something powerful, right? And I, and I just wanna kind of sit with, especially for those members of the board um, and, and uh, frankly, those that weren't on the board, but were members of the community, I know that you were actively there. Um, it, you know, it was a powerful experience to, uh, to really unleash our collective imagination. And, and so as you're listening today, you know, I want you to go back to two, day, two years ago, right? And in that process, um, the visioning process, where we, we, we really did a powerful, uh, there was a powerful experience, right, with our community uh, to launch this, this, this vision. Um, I think it was a recognition that uh, we couldn't do it alone and that we cannot do this alone, right? Uh, uh, the superintendent has, has, has said before, you know, he, we're looking to bring back the public in public education because sometimes it, uh, it gets lost, right? Um, and, and so we as, as system leaders, as district officials know that we cannot do it alone. Uh, it takes one community, right? And I think that was the big thing um, that, that stood out to me, you know, again, if you think about two years ago uh, and even now, you know, we are, we are one community one district, right, uh, uh, embracing a collective responsibility. So just wanted to, to highlight and, and really uh, set the context for, for, for this conversation. Next slide. And so, as you know, um, this is our, our, our vision, but, but the, reason I, uh, the reason we wanted to make sure uh, uh, to, to, to sit uh, on the vision for, for a second is to really think about how these core values uh, really sit in all our engagement. Every time we talk to a parent, every talk, every time we talk to a student, a community member, how are we living out these core values? Every time we're sitting at the dais, right, figuratively uh, or uh, literally, you know, how are we living into these core values? And how do they, you know, uh, how, how do we think about them from an engagement standpoint? And as, as we think about engagement and bringing in our community into to our, to our work, uh, we think about how uh, our, our, our community is, is, is crucial to, to realizing the shifts that we need as a system. Uh, we obviously know we need our, our community uh, at the center to realize our uh, uh, graduate portrait and educator essentials, but, uh, but really to drive the system shifts. Uh, uh, our community engagement is, is right smack in the middle uh, of, of, of the shifts, right? Of really connecting and transforming the school district of uh, uh, creating and aligning uh, racial, racial equity uh, structures, uh, creating community uh, schools as community hubs, et cetera. Uh, so, so next slide. So as we think about, uh, actually before we do that, sorry. So, pause it for, so, um, so and, I, and it may be, have been a while since you all have seen this video but I want you, as you sit to this video, and again, I, I want you to, 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 to imagine the vision, think about the vision process, think about what's in the vision, and then think about this video and think about this idea of one district and what does it mean to be a one district PPS? Uh, and then we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Go ahead, Shanice. Where do I start? Start with what I believe in. I believe. What I believe. I believe in the democracy of success. I believe in words. These words, all words, that allow me to say, to communicate and connect. I believe in the dignity of failure, when that failure is recognized for the risks I take every day to achieve. You achieve. I achieve when you believe. I believe in the ubiquity of success. No matter your zip code, no matter your background, no matter your gender, no matter your sexuality, no matter what people perceive your ability to be. I believe in Portland Public Schools. This is where we grew up. Where we learned our ABCs. Where we learned to compete with honor. And with grace. And how to reserve judgment because nobody has a monopoly on success. Portland Public Schools is where we learn how to solve for X. This is where we started as kids. And became artists. Encoders. 
scientists, and architects. We grew up in a city that's famous for innovation and for being just a little off-center. To find the soul of an amazing city like Portland, look no further than its public schools. So stand with us. Believe in us. We believe in the audacity of success that every student in every school in every neighborhood has the right to achieve. We are transforming Portland Public Schools and reimagining public education. We are your next generation of startups. We are your creative power. We are your leaders of tomorrow. We, we achieve when you believe in us. us. We are Portland. 50,000 students. 90 schools and programs. One district. We are PPS, one district. So one district, uh, we achieve when you believe. Uh, you know, uh, I, it was, it's great to see this video because Justice, as you all know, interned in my office uh, right before you, she went to the University of Oregon. And uh, it's just good to see, see her face. Uh, but I think this, this video, you know, again, it's been a while since maybe a lot of us have seen it, but I hope it reminds you and reminds all of us in our community that we are one district, right? Uh, uh, and that we are one community looking out for each other uh, and what does that look like, right? And, and I think that's, that's an important thing. And, and I think that, that goes to the next slide, um, which I'm really, really, really proud of. Um, work, uh, you know, when, when Danny Ledesma, our senior advisor on racial equity, uh, joined the organization, um, you know, uh, one of the first uh, initiatives or, 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 or actions that we, we took uh, collectively is to, to outline goals for the organization. Uh, and what you see in front of you are, are racial equity and social justice goals uh, related to engagement, related to leadership and student voice. Uh, and, and, and I just want you to, 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 to I, I just in, I share this with you uh, because many, many of these goals or all of these goals really have been driving our conversations uh, internally as, a, as an office as we are rebuilding the Office of Engagement, as we're re, uh, rebuilding and, uh, you know, trust uh, with our community, which, uh, which never ends, um, it, it never stops. Uh, and, and so uh, to really these goals um, are, are, are so, just some of the, uh, the, the goals that are some of the objectives that we are looking to meet uh, uh, from a from a racial equity uh, and social justice lens. So, so just wanted to provide a little bit of frame uh, framework or, or frame uh, frame uh, to uh, to the next portion of the the conversation, which I'm going to turn over to Shanice Clark, our director of engagement, to kind of walk you and introduce you a little bit into uh, the community engagement and student voice department. Greetings, uh, Superintendent Guerrero, Board of Education, uh, and everyone this evening. I'm Shanice Clark, uh, the Director of Community Engagement, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our work and our framework. Uh, so our department is really uh, linking uh, community engagement and student voice. Um, as a conduit for folks to participate as thought partners uh, as we move with shifts in our system and policies that uplift uh, the day-to-day -day lives of our students, uh, families, and greater community. And we have overarching core functions that we hope to support and build capacity with all areas of our system and see uh, short and long-term work uh, that we'll uh, talk a little bit more about tonight. Uh, but uh, through our free work, consultation, technical support, uh, we're really uh, engaging our diverse communities, especially Black, Native, uh, communities of color uh, and our multilingual communities. Uh, we uh, seek to partner with our families and school staff and uh, have the ability uh, to uh, support programming uh, that gives both direct service um, and areas of thought partnership. And so we'll, we'll talk about that as well. 
and so uh, really these core areas are aiming at the ability for us to uh, weave in opportunities to uh, adapt with the insight and foresight of community and see uh, iterative processes uh, where we can learn um, from them and improve our practice uh, to make that and really achieve that systems change um, is, is really our goal. And so uh, we have uh, values that are kind of aspirations, uh, the North Star of what we really want to achieve uh, through different initiatives that are central uh, to the work at Portland Public Schools and racial equity and social justice, uh, as Chief Garcia has mentioned, uh, is really uh, meant to uh, take that uh, cognition and insight um, as uh, as expertise uh, from our students and community members. And so uh, we really see that as a part of ways we can see and identify gaps in our system uh, to make meaningful change uh, to school improvement. And uh, deep democracy uh, is really this idea uh, that we know that uh, there might be challenging dynamics, power dynamics, uh, that are present in ways that structures are traditionally built, that processes are should traditionally built, and uh, thinking about the ways in which we have multiple means of reaching our communities and multiple means of going about our uh, partnership uh, is, a, is a way that we think about uh, making room and space for different ideas, tensions, perspectives uh, that are needed um, and essential uh, to uh, improving our system. And youth uh, empowerment. Uh, student voice is really uh, an essential part of uh, why, why we're all here. And we wanna be able to help uh, both our, our department and overall system uh, have the supports in place uh, to also uh, build their capacity uh, to engage with uh, decision-making and support and invest in their um, overall enrichment and opportunities for their success. And uh, we have a team. Uh, you'll see uh, community engagement specialists uh, and community agents. Uh, our community engagement specialists uh, are uh, Maria, Yen, and Izel, really focusing on those areas of decision making in our district. And our community agents uh, are multilingual uh, advocates for schools and families. Uh, that are consultants, collaborators, uh, engagement specialists, but in a way that serve uh, families to get academic support uh, in uh, continuous um, engagement to make informed decisions um, for, uh, for and with uh, their students. And so engagement, um, I think there are multiple ways uh, that community engagement shows up in our system. And I won't read each one of these boxes, but really informing, consulting, involving, collaborating, and empowering our communities are all ways that we see uh, interconnected. And so it seems linear, but this is really a spectrum, these components can manifest differently, they can happen simultaneously uh, based off of a need or a process or a decision. And uh, we see uh, the uh, space for us uh, to both operate in ways that are responsive to the needs and community and the work that they do, and also uh, our district business that informs their day-to-day -day lives. And uh, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about something called redefining the system, which is really informed the development our, of our framework. And uh, a grant funded by the Meyer Memorial Trust uh, has really been an effort that helped uh, ground uh, us in our work to think about conditions and resources. Uh, that are essential uh, for our work. So uh, a process has unfolded where uh, we created a team and uh, on the left box, you'll see uh, a list of the community uh, organizations that were a part of our team, but really had opportunities uh, to reach uh, folks across our system, especially students uh, to participate in a process, learning a little bit about how we 
focus on these areas of decision making, especially our shifts um, in funding, policy, student supports, um, and these things that have uh, direct impacts um, on the day to day lives of our students and our families. And uh, we are here. Uh, the, the last uh, point here is the, the board study session and is really an opportunity to talk about um, our journey uh, where uh, steering team strategy sessions and opportunities where we've connected, uh, especially with our uh, Black, Native, and students of color um, have informed the framework that we will show you now. And uh, before we unpack it a little bit, I want to mention uh, Karen Mapp, uh, who is a senior lecturer at the uh, Harvard Gravi Graduate School of Education and really an expert in family and community engagement, uh, thought about a, a framework, uh, a dual capacity framework. And it's important for us at, at Portland Public Schools because it really reinforces this value that uh, the cognition and capabilities uh, of our students and families really help uh, mitigate structural barriers uh, that, in, that uh, impact student achievement. And so uh, in support of this grant uh, from the Maya Memorial Trust, we were really able to work with groups of folks to finalize the framework and key strategies uh, that might reinforce uh, different levels of our organization. And so uh, as you can see, uh, each of these areas uh, connections will start there. Um, each have a little descriptor with two essential elements um, that we hope to uh, continue and create need statements for uh, in a design phase um, that will really inform uh, our support for schools. But it's truly grounding and connections. Um, we would be able to uplift student voice, uh, really our Black, Indigenous, uh, mixed, and students of color, and providing them spaces for leadership and using multiple means for them uh, to do so and operate with autonomy. Um, those two things are uh, something that we would, uh, as an example, uh, take and make a need statement for and uh, identify things that are tailorable for our schools and departments uh, to uh, have strategies um, in, in trainings we'll develop. And so uh, the, the confidence area cultivates student-centered env environments and design accessible to students with different abilities. Um, really thinking about um, our accessibility, uh, the conditions and structures, the resources and tools that we use to think about environments and design. And so really thinking about structural elements that impact the way folks uh, feel, experience, and are able to access um, these very spaces um, that we um, talk about uh, big decisions um, and important things that impact our schools and students. Um, and honor student and community intelligence to lessen racist inequities impacting our work um, is really uh, embedded in our cognition area. As we see, um, I'm using the language, uh, our communities and students um, as expertise or experts. And so really thinking about that as a mechanism uh, to help address uh, gaps in our system. And uh, the, the last uh, capabilities um, is really a space where we hope to organize young people um, as we continue to shift the educational system, uh, thinking of those system shifts um, and acknowledge um, current social issues uh, that they uh, experience. And so I definitely see uh, 2021 uh, during the winter as a time where we develop need statements uh, for each of these areas. And uh, then the next phase will be able uh, to really launch uh, direct support uh, for uh, schools, departments, and folks across our system. And uh, actually just recently uh, were, was able to post a program manager position, uh, which will um, have in large part uh, dedicated uh, to thinking about uh, working directly with students, especially students of color, uh, and designing um, both the need statements um, for each of these elements and uh, the strategies uh, thereafter. And uh, really the capabilities uh, that we uh, are thinking about 
uh, and then as a result of this framework is this roadmap. And so um, taking the framework um, with our roadmap, uh, we'll have uh, these uh, pieces of uh, needs identified um, through further engagement, uh, but are really excited uh, that we have this framework to be able to uh, reinforce uh, both the ability for uh, students and families to be uh, better thought partners with our district. And uh, we see uh, the systemic change uh, for uh, departments and areas in, in our system as something we want to start to develop um, and build uh, and ground some roots for. And so uh, as we transition, I know we're a little uh, short on time, that there is a list of uh, projects uh, that are key initiatives that uh, I wanted to reflect on um, a little bit after uh, reflecting on the framework, uh, as they capture a lot of areas um, that are continuous uh, and important and critical uh, to the communities uh, that are a part of our system. And so um, I won't unpack each of these items, uh, but through coordination with uh, various stakeholders, even folks um, from other districts uh, to be able to reinforce and support and implement uh, programming uh, that you see listed here um, is a lot of our focus and we hope to take this framework to reinforce um, and further articulate um, the initiatives that happen at Portland Public Schools and both uh, the system's ability uh, to weave families um, into the fabric of our work. And Shanice, before we get into the discussion, I just want to uh, just acknowledge, you know, you've been uh, in your role for about a year, um, right? Um, and um, the list that you just showed is just a, a sample size of the ma the massive amount of work that is on your shoulder as the director of engagement. Uh, so I just want to uh, very much acknowledge the incredible work that that you uh, and the team lead. Um, uh, and and I, I couldn't do it without you. I know that uh, many of my colleagues uh, will say the same thing. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that and, and put that into context that you know, uh, I think a lot of a lot of our work uh, may seem siloed, uh, but um, all of this work is interconnected, and uh, the interconnection and the, and the intersection is our families and our students, right? And so, uh, and at the heart of, of of helping us, you know, bring our families and our students to uh, to that work um, is Shanice's leadership. So I just want to acknowledge Shanice uh, for that. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, Shanice. I pre appreciate it. Um, and yes, there, there's much more happening uh, in our train station, but uh, for, for this evening, I think is a, is a good lens at what is, uh, what is of most uh, uh, at the front, at the front of our work. And so it's time to, time to chat a little bit. Um, I'm curious about uh, your perspectives, especially as we think about our framework uh, values and vision for Portland Public School students, um, we uh, want to have a, a short discussion. And so uh, one uh, question we want to have uh, for the board is uh, an example um, of a time that you might have participated in a community engagement effort that felt authentic and intentional, and what you might have heard, and if you're able to describe that experience. So an example of an authentic and intentional vibe at an engagement event or initiative? Um, I put this in the chat, but um, I recently um, experienced the work of your department um, in a renaming um, conversation. And when I first got into the room, I was really surprised at the diversity of voices. It wasn't all people that were gung-ho necessarily. And I was just really impressed that you assembled um, people to provide really critical feedback into the process. Um, I'm thinking about the, um, I think it was the Student Success Act um, sessions, and I'm one particular out of Fabian, 
um, we just was really, you know, sitting down in the small groups and, and having conversations and they were prompted by questions and then putting things up on the wall. It was, um, it was just, it was a powerful moment as a board member to be able to, to both listen to, but also engage in those conversations and, and just a, a really incredible turnout of very thoughtful people. Director Scott, if, if I may, um, what, how did you feel like, so go back to that, that, that event, well, how did you feel like what, what, what were the feelings, you know, in, in you that made you like, this was good. This was exciting. This was, you, I, my, my voice was heard, or I don't know what, what, what well, what, I mean, I mean, personally, my feeling was, it was a little bit of sort of humility, right. Of just sort of like being in a room with just people who brought a, a diverse perspective, but really thoughtful and 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 very engaged and willing to to share it. And so it was more a moment of for me. It was more a moment of of listening, right? It was more that moment of of like like <laughs> now, now's the time to to shut up and be quiet. Um, was the feeling I had at the time. I'm not sure that's quite getting to your question, but yeah, I appreciate it. I'm thinking of the uh, budget discussions we had. It might have been two years ago. Uh, when we did kind of a world cap cafe kind of uh, layout and attendees had a chance to talk directly with senior management about, you know, budget issues, but that's, that's everything. And I could just see that there was so much appreciation in being able to have that direct conversation back and forth, you know, just down to earth, plain, plain talk um, happening that builds trust. And, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of trust rebuilding to do. Absolutely. I'm thinking about the, um, the state of the SROs event that we had that was entirely student led and there was uh, spoken word, there was music, there was panel discussion, there was a huge diversity of perspectives, there was a graceful navigation of a lot of intense uh, tension in the room. Uh, it's the only public meeting I've been to where when I went to leave, uh, you know, there were, there was a police officer who didn't ask me, but told me he was going to walk me to my car. Um, but it was, it was a really fruitful discussion and um, uh, it was, it was beautiful. It was really well done. Jonathan, um, I'm, I'm interested in, and want to invite Nathaniel uh, because engagement, you know, of course, happens a lot among the adults, uh, but engagement is also about how we incorporate youth leadership and voice. So if you have some thoughts on that, Nathaniel, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, Nathaniel, I'd love to hear kind of an example where you you participated in an effort that you felt authentic, intentional, and felt heard. Um, well, I mean, obviously, I'm a big fan of the DSC in general. Um, don't want to really pick out any specific instance, but I think that it is a great institution that we have. Um, hmm. I mean, come to think of it, like uh, the focus group that we had um, a few months ago on the bond, um, back when we were still trying to figure out what the package would look like. I think that was that was good. We had a robust conversation there. Um, I don't know. Another unrelated thing, um, I don't know if this falls strictly under the engagement department, but the um, the CMPC we had at Jefferson for determining, you know, what the what our buildings um, might look like in the future was really um, organic, I'd say, um, and definitely felt like the community was um, getting its opportunity to be heard. Um, and so when you say the, in, in that example, the community felt heard. What, what, what was it about the experience that you, you think that the community felt heard? Well, let me rephrase. I don't know if the community felt heard. I don't mean to speak for everyone, but I think that it was representative of the Jefferson community that I see. Yeah. Um, and 
I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to speculate too much. Um, but it, I mean, it was essentially open door. Um, the entire community was invited. We had like attendance of like 60 people or something. It was large. Um, and we, but we, we had a good structure. Um, there, there actually was a process for getting input from everyone despite the attendance. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think I think um, we've we've been given uh, the um, the ten minute uh, uh, notice. So I think we'll move over to the next, next conversation um, really quick. And and I just want to emphasize: yes, we have ten minutes. This is an introduction. Not there's no proposal. There's no plan. There's nothing. This is a study session to have a conversation with all of you. Nothing is fully baked. This is just an example something that we want to share. So uh, one of the areas that uh, Director Bailey and I have uh, had discussions uh, over the years is around the, the community advisories, right? Uh, and the role that community advisories have uh, and, and how do we create bodies that make sense? And so uh, right now, as we think about this organization in the district, I think there are, um, community advisory councils, right? Um, uh, the ones that kind of are, you know, here with the school board and or the, our, our, our school board or super center sponsored. Um, and, and so then we have joint committees or task forces that are, that are developed that are short term tasks um, to develop, you know, specific work groups uh, that include community members as active participants. So think about Lippy and, you know, some of the distance learning and, and some of the uh, short-term tasks that, that need to be accomplished. And the last area where I think we see a big body of community advisory happening is around school-based leadership, right? Um, if not all, I think all of our schools have school site councils, uh, uh, and then you can see the arrangement of, of student leadership groups, right? Affinity groups, like uh, you heard from our uh, Native American student uh, group at, at, at Grant. Right, so so as as we know, there are a number of ways, uh, official ways, if you will, that uh, communities can get involved uh, in through formal structures. Next slide, and so one of the things that um, uh, we wanted to think about uh, and share with you as a as an idea uh, to start a conversation is around uh, again with Director Bailey, um, and I'd love for Director Bailey to share a little bit. So really lifting up uh, and reviving and re-energizing the community advisory councils uh, as a district-wide collective of diverse members, especially students and parents uh, and guardians that provide direct advisement to the Board of Education, serving as community ambassadors and conduits for the shared voices of our community and school district. So our, uh, as an initial conversation, and again, I welcome an opportunity to have an extensive discussion because we have eight minutes now uh, around uh, what this could look like. So, you know, one one example here is that the board appoints members to each of the CACs from their respective zones, right? Uh, and the superintendent appoints staff liaisons to those CACs. Um, and so, what does this all look like? Uh, uh, is part of the conversation. So, uh, Director Bailey, um, love to, to, you know, you and I have been talking about this on and off for years, and I know others have shown interest in this. Any thoughts uh, before we, or, and then uh, you want to lead the conversation at the beginning of the conversation? Yeah, so the, um, I've been uh, attending, for example, TAG, TAG Act, the TAG Advisory Committee. Uh, I've been to a lot of SPIAC, the Special Education advisory committee meetings. Um, I wrote, helped write policy many years ago on a parent involvement district committee. Um, and the district has never embraced those committees in any official way in terms of who's on them, what the goal is, how they interact, either with the board or the superintendent on a formal ongoing basis, how they, for example, could inform um, our budget uh, discussions. Uh, we hear from them individually when they come to testify on us because there's 
a burning issue. But my experience is these are passionate, mostly parents and community members who are well-versed in their subject area, have that on the ground experience uh, with their children dealing with, uh, well, you might hear it comes down like this, but here's how it's really happening at the school level, which is such a valuable viewpoint. And we're not taking advantage of that like we could. So uh, just how, how could we, you know, and here's, again, there's site councils or another area, don't get me started there. Um, but just looking at these advisory councils, and also I called up OSBA a couple of years ago and asked, which of these are mandated? Because some of them are mandated by either or, uh, state or federal law. They couldn't tell me. <laughs> so uh, who, who knows, but how, uh, pick one, how, what would a, a really good model look like or how uh, we could empower that council, uh, put them to good use to inform us to make better decisions. Uh, again, through our vision and values through the RESJ lens um, to, you know, move our, shift our system. Um, and again, if we, when we do that authentically, we build trust and public ownership of our schools. Um, so I just wanna throw that out there, ideas for how we go forward, uh, yeah. you know, maybe some low hanging fruit to start with, but then also some bigger picture. So Director, so Director Bailey, knowing that we have four minutes and I wanna be, and I, I think this is a very important conversation. Um, it, uh, Shanice, if you can go back uh, to this, uh, to the document, to the slide. Uh, and I just want to highlight, because I think what, what we're, we're proposing here is to work on a shared agreement around, you know, developing an operations manual that details purpose, shared agreements, and overall structure of the CACs. So working with all of you to, to kind of come up with that, right? Because I think this is an opportunity, uh, uh, a collective uh, opportunity to think about how we, to your point, Director Bailey, um, you know, really really uh utilize the the advisement um uh and the, the 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 collective wisdom of our community and i i just want to jump in jonathan and say that i think one of the conversations we've all we've also been having as a board is how do we um encourage diverse leadership development so that we have a pipeline of people to run for school board that um, more fully represent our community and i think there's something here with the cacs that could absolutely way for people to to have an opportunity to run for school board absolutely I'm also uh, very interested um i really appreciate you um director bailey and um jonathan bringing the topic forward um i know the city just went last year went through a a, a complete audit of every um every single um community or um advisory committee and um you know, we had we we identified some committees that had members, the same members for 27 years on the same committees. So in an effort to diversify the voices that we were hearing from, you know, do some active recruitment and really use the the power, you know, inherent in the community and the knowledge. Um I I, I would love to delve into this more. I'm I'm wondering if there's a small group of us uh current members of the board that would be willing to work with staff to outline what that might look like. Um, we, would I, we would welcome that opportunity. Take, take, um, I was going to say to also take um, your leadership. Um, I think your instincts are really excellent and right on in terms of, you know, what an outcome could look like a diverse pipeline. Um, I'd be willing to, you know, I mean, just work with you with staff. Absolutely. And, uh, director to, pass, to, to build on your point, uh, we're not going to be able to recruit if we don't uh, have committees that have uh, a real purpose and impact. Um, right, so right. I, I think I think we need to get that redesign going um, and then we have something where we can, can recruit for. Absolutely. So one thing for, um, this is a sort of overarching comment on um, this 
uh, concept, but also the last topic we had is when I've found really authentic conversations and insights, it's usually when you're, it's very place-based. It's when you're in somebody else's where they, where they feel comfortable sharing their narrative versus it being there, um, a community member being in sort of like the ESC or like in a space that belongs to like leadership or a power or authority. Um, so somehow keeping these grounded in, in sort of community and places where people feel comfortable, feel comfortable um, speaking up. That's when I find, like I say, students, it's usually like in the classroom um parents and families it's usually in their schools um it's generally not in BESC or in sort of like a conference center so i've i think sort of place based is really important uh for the to elicit people feeling very comfortable to speak their truth and um disagree or you know share share their point of view in a really direct way Absolutely. And I'm going to jump in again. I'm sorry, I can't see anybody's face. I can just see the presentation. Um, somebody mentioned the budget process. I had a great conversation last week with Amanda, who I can't remember her last name. She works for Particip Participatory Budgeting Oregon and um, reports that school districts love participatory budgeting. I would be happy to put um, Jonathan or Shanice in touch with her. She's amazing. She brings an equity lens. She's a white woman. Um, I just, we had a 15 or 20 minute conversation. We talked for an hour. So she has a lot to say about it. It's not that you give the entire budget over to the public. You give a very sliver of it um, and give them the agency to empower them to give some feedback. I think it's brilliant. Um, I know electeds uh, like the process because it looks good. It feels good and it is good. May I, I follow up with you offline? Please. I, I think Director Moore had a, a comment she wanted to make, except she's disappeared now. OK, um, sometimes her internet gets grumpy. Jonathan, do you want to go ahead and, and wrap us up? Yeah, so um, so obviously this is a uh, this piece here is uh, well again first want to thank you for for the opportunity to, to come and share uh, again I want to just appreciate all the leadership and the work of Shanice and and the team uh, in our community engagement and student voice office uh, and then lastly I think as we think about these advisories um, I was communicating with uh, director uh, with Chair Lowry um, you know I think director to pass. Uh, working with uh, a, a subset of, of the board to really refine and define and create some some structures with uh, uh, Roseanne Powell, myself, and Shanice, and others, I think will be will will be a, a, an immediate next step um, that we can then bring to the the entire board. So I appreciate your time and um, thank you for this uh, opportunity. Okay, I will, in my uh, Wednesday email, I'm going to go ahead uh, that I send out tomorrow, I'm going to ask for folks who want to be engaged in this process. And Jonathan is asking for three board members to come alongside him in this work. So um, let me know if you're interested and I'll send that on the email and then uh, we'll, we'll arm wrestle if there's more than three folks who are interested. Although, as we know, if we arm wrestle, I lose to Michelle. So we've tried that before. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Unfortunately, director. I can't remember Lowry, whose idea that was. Was that was that your idea? Oh, it was hundred percent my idea. I always say let's arm wrestle because I know I'm going to lose, but it's hilarious. So. <laughs> <laughs> and director uh, Moore, I read your comment. Thank you. And yes. Do you want to read it out to all of us, Jonathan? Since this is still technically a public meeting. Of course. Uh, apparently, you couldn't hear me. Maybe I wasn't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> the CDIC would like to engage in the discussion about more clarity of their roles and scope of work. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I think I, you know, I'm, I'm on some of the CACs and 
I don't even know who's in charge or how to contact them to, to find out how to participate and support them. So this would be really helpful. So thank you for your work. And um, again, Shanice, thank you for um, all you do and the incredible amount of work that goes into this really vital part of what we do, um, engaging publicly. All right, anything else for the good of the order before we say good night? Agenda setting tomorrow. So get those topics into us so we can discuss them tomorrow at 11. And then don't forget, we have a complaint hearing uh, meeting around a complaint, special meeting around a complaint on Thursday at five. All right. See you all later. Good night. Adjourning good the night. meeting. I'm adjourning the meeting. Good night. <laughs> good night. Good night.